Howdy, welcome to another exciting video lecture. This one is about chapter 17, interested in network effects. So network effects, uh, just to review quickly, the purchasers here of a product is taking into account their intrinsic interest, that is how much the product is useful to them uh, just as a baseline and then they're going to add up also the number of other users of that good Remember in this case each person is making an individual choice and their reservation price is the maximum that person is willing to pay based on the intrinsic interest If there's no network effects the reservation prices uh, Don't have any effect on how many other people are using it and so those are combined and with the cost per unit to get the equilibrium quantity, you know this as a supply and a demand curve. So without network effects, it's a pretty normal uh, downward sloping demand curve, just like we're used to. And like we said, or like you learned already in economics, the producers are going to use the marginal cost of a unit to set the price. And then that's how the price is kept at equilibrium. Well, with network effects, though, the number of other users affects how useful that product is. So here's an important thing to emphasize that is not clear in the book. That is, each network effects curve is unique to each user, and for each user it's unique to each product. So you know, depending on what application you're using, depending on what computer you're using, depending on what kind of car you're driving or going to think about buying, all of those have different uh, demand curve, or sorry, network effects curves. And so <clears throat> the, gra the thing you're seeing now is a network effects curve where if there is only a small number of people using the product, this user gets no additional um, benefit from it. So this has like a, you know, between maybe zero and 10% of the population using it, this user gets no extra expectations. So, um, when network effects are in play, we are interested in taking this curve of the user's network effects and factoring it into what's going on. Now, when network effects are factored in, you still get a normal downward sloping demand curve, okay? So what we would do here is this would be at a given proportion of the population. We'll talk about this in a minute. So let's say everyone's kind of assuming like 70% of the population is going to buy this product. The people here with the very high reserve prices, they have a very high extra benefit probably from you know the extra people that are using it. And as we get down, down, down to the lower end consumers, those consumers have a fairly low amount of intrinsic benefit. And remember, the interesting benefit here is, you know, that baseline worth they have, like what is the reserve price if there was no network effect at all, plus whatever network effect there is. Again, the ones on the right that are at the very bottom have like a, a low, ex, a low uh, reserve price, so they're not going to buy it for a, a price higher than that. So it looks like a normal downward sloping demand curve. Now, this is not very clear in the book. Double sure, each user determines their own network effect. So I've graphed here four users. You can see three of them, but the fourth one is basically graphed on the bottom. This high uh, sloping graph person, they have a network effect. It starts at zero, so if no one's using the product, this, this particular consumer, user four, has no benefit to using the product, but you can see for this top user, they have a nice high sort of uh, graph going up, and it reaches a peak, and then it kind of starts to slope off. And I want to emphasize here, this is the idea of having a declining marginal return. If we're to, you know, to graph it for each user, this is like that graph we saw earlier where, you know, at a, you know, at some point, it starts to not benefit you that much, you know, over 50%, over 70%, over 80%. So user four, um, I've just made up these numbers because they work. Uh, user four has this nice network effect graph that is, you know, at Z equals zero, so no one using it, they have an effect of zero. If 100% of the people are using it, this person gets an extra little bump to their reserve price of three. You see user three, um, they would get a two bump at the 100% adoption. 
uh, user 2 would get a, a 1 bump to their adoption. And user 1, I want you to just note that they're there, but you can't see them. They're just at the very bottom of the graph, and they get no network effect at all. And like I said, I'm using that 2 minus z because we get a nice diminishing return. All right, so on here, we're uh, showing all of the possible demand curves. Uh, the formula for each demand curve um, is shown here, and you can just calculate it based on the different proportions. So if we pop in there 100% for Z, and then we put in the user, you know, X, number four, number three, number two, number one, and you would get the different um, reserve prices for each user. So basically a separate demand curve at each expected proportion. So the 100% adoption isn't shown here. That would be 4, 3, 2, and 1. 0% uh, adoption would also be that flat line there, where it would just be 0. And the ones here are a 25% proportion, a 50% proportion, and a 75% proportion. So if you look here, we have these, uh, each one graphed. And now we can actually go using these graphs and say, look, OK, at a given price, you know, how much do you expect people to buy? So given the different demand curves with the different uh, reserve prices, we can just slide in here and say, OK, look, uh, if we set, for example, the price of two, so a price of two here, you can see here the only that uh, top user would buy it. So we'd have a one quarter adoption rate. So one quarter of the people would adopt it and at a price of two. If we set the price of one, you can see across there, you can just barely see, by the way, that the first, um, the first user has a reserve price on that bottom green graph. Only the first user has a, a reserve price um, above one. The rest of them are below one. But if we slide over and we hit that other graph there, that orange graph you can see there where we would have um, you'd see that the, or actually we would hit that purple graph where you'd have two people adopting and it's still two people there too. So at a price of one, you would expect a 50% adoption. Okay? Or a 25%, I guess that's not shown on here. There's lots of different options here. But notice if we set the price to a 0.9, you can see here where at a 0.9, we're gonna still get that top user. Uh, the second user is not gonna buy it if um, we're assuming a one quarter um, expectation. But if you slide over to the 75% expectation, you can see where on the 75% curve, you would also get 75%. So that's kind of cool to think about it, right? If we set the price of 0.9, a self-fulfilling expectation of 0.25 and of 0.75 works, okay? So the, the issue is for us as a company to try to convince everyone that it's going to be more than 25 percent that are going to adopt our thing okay so the book um, i'm just going to put this in here the book does this using a parabolic function and that honestly just drove me crazy because it didn't have di um, a diminishing returns of network effects if you do it with diminishing returns of network effects you end up with a cubic function but for all intents and purposes, like the actual like drawing on a graph uh, works the same. So if we drew our line across here, you can see at the line at one, there is indeed, remember there's two equilibria point there. Um, on the last graph, I kind of, at least the slide kind of doesn't show it. There's also the 0.9, we can get all the way up to 0.75% uh, adopting. And so that's very exciting. Uh, but again, you know, the cubic function does work. It'd be a lot more trouble to solve. And the fun part of this is I'm not even going to make you solve a uh, parabolic function either. So once you've done that, then we got the equilibrium proportions. So those, you know, if there's a double equilibrium, that's great. And we have the situation where we have to try to convince extra people to buy it. Um, that's lovely. Um, there's not much uh, going on other than what you did in your uh, graphs. And so you can calculate things like if we're ever hitting the very top of that graph, then you're in big trouble and you're, you know, you're going to have a hard time getting people to maintain that price. Uh, you can adjust your prices and get multiple or different equilibria. 
And then the book makes a big point about the tipping points. Um, there isn't a lot more to say here than what happens in the book, where you, 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 know, you want to try to be on the upward above the tipping point, where you're pushing it up, because there is definitely pressure, obviously, down towards zero. And then if you can get above that first tipping point, you have the pressure all the way up to the middle thing. Um, yeah, and you just have to convince people to do it. So it is important to remember this is a, this shared expectation and the, you know, what they call the expectations equilibria. It's a lazy S function, and that's really, again, this idea of the cubic function. And I just want to emphasize here, this is the, this is sort of the war look of it over time. So early on, you would have um, the expectation might be, or you're trying to hit an expectation of, you know, 25%, let's say, but, you know, as long as you're below that 25% adoption rate, like you're fighting with people to try to convince them that you're going to hit 25%. But boy, once you get above 25%, you know, it's a free ride almost up to the next, sort of that uh, next tipping point. So I think this graph actually illustrates better what's going on in terms of like the struggle as a company of why you're trying to push people above that first tipping point. So there are situations, and this is kind of the lucky situation, hopefully, where there is an intrinsic value of the product. A good example of this is like an electric car, where yes, there are uh, network effects of an electric car. Like I'm not going to buy an electric car until I can you know, drive it somewhere. And in that case, I need to have these remote charging stations and those aren't going to appear unless a lot of people adopt an electric car. And we're literally though at the point of this medium um, point where it's like, you know, we're not sure yet. It does kind of seem like electric cars are going to hit the point where there's enough. And so we're kind of convinced and, you know, more and more people are probably just going to start buying electric cars. But hopefully you can see this has happened over a long time. When the Tesla first came out, you know, they put in a few charging stations, but it was really, I think, between just Washington, D.C. and maybe New York City. And so the people that were buying a Tesla when they first came out were people that thought an electric car was really cool. Any of you that have driven an electric car, especially one of the Teslas, you, you, you can experience it as like they're super, super silent. And also they accelerate like you, that is a performance car. And so people were adopting the Tesla, at least the model, the first Tesla and then the Model S, just because it was a great car, even though, you know, at the time there was not, you know, not, not much idea that electric cars would even get anywhere. So this graph here shows you, this is kind of an illustration of why there's a life cycle where innovators, like the bleeding edge people, will adopt something first. But you still have to convince, you know, that next set of people. This isn't a market life cycle class. Early adopters would be the next set, and those ones would have to be convinced, like, okay, you know, come on, keep going. You know, these, the new... The new like car nerds already bought this, but what we need is you know you performance people. You just we're gonna build this stuff. We're gonna build those stations. Keep buying them, because you really have to convince people to get it above where the expectation, where the actual is above the expectation, and that way it, it keeps forcing or pushing adoption higher. So if you're in an industry and you're competing directly with someone. So if you're Apple and you're competing directly with Microsoft and you're trying to get in on games, you know, you're going to set the price of your stuff lower. It's the idea that you can get an entrance into the market and then, you know, push your stuff up to that higher equilibrium and be able to get um, economies of scale and basically make more money. And this is why, you know, when a company comes in with a new product anytime, they're trying to push for everyone thinking it's going to be a big deal. So that's it. Um, Hopefully you're looking forward to the next one, and we will see you then.